Welcome to the Applied uh, Topology Seminar. Uh, so the speaker today will be Catherine Hess, and she will tell us how to grow synthetic uh, digital neurons. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's a, yep. it's a pleasure to participate in this seminar. I spoke in this seminar once a few years ago when I was starting off in this research at the intersection of applied topology and neuroscience. And today I'm going to be talking about a project in which we've been applying topology in order to study neuron morphologies. So neurons come in all kinds of shapes. There's a tremendous diversity of the shapes and sizes and uh, forms in general of, of neurons. And this understanding the shapes of neurons is really important because their morphology informs their function. So depending on exactly how long the branching is, how, how wild the branching is, and so on, you have different, you can say different things about the function. And so here, what I'm showing you right now is just some indication of what the diversity of morphologies looks like in the brain. There we see uh, visualizations of pyramidal cells from rat cortex. And we see that there are a wide variety of sizes and shapes and how branchy they are and where they're branching and so on. And it's important, therefore, to be able to classify the neurons based on this morphology and then also for some of the uh, digital reconstructions that are being made of microcircuits of neurons or, or whole brains and so on, it's also important to be able to populate these networks with uh, neurons that are actually biologically representative. So the goals of this project, which have been ongoing basically since I started working with the Blue Brain project uh, more than five years ago, or around five years ago, is um, First of all, we wanted to s develop tools for objective classification of neuromorphologies. So for basically as long as people have been looking at more at neurons under microscopes, they've been trying to divide them into different classes based on what their shapes are like. And they've had diff different methods for doing so, which go from being so expert at looking at neurons under a microscope that you can just look at one and say, oh, this is a layer five pyramidal cell of this type to trying to be a little bit more objective about things and using various morphometrics, so various numerical measurements associated to neurons, then using those to sort of do some sort of comparison, which also has its, its pitfalls. And we wanted to develop something that was even more objective that didn't require us actually to choose different morphometrics and so on. So we've developed tools for doing so. But once we had tools for doing so, the idea was, sorry, we have to get the lights on again, but they won't lose this. Anyway, to, once we had this tool for uh, classifying neurons, the idea was to say, well, maybe we can sort of run the machine backwards and use this classification tool in order to produce more synthetic digital neurons to populate some of these uh, digital models that people are making of parts of the brain, such as what they're doing in the Blue Brain Project. So I'm going to say a little bit more about this kind of motivation towards the end of the talk. But the idea is that if you want to have a really accurate or as accurate as possible digital model, computer model of an actual network of neurons, then you need a wide variety and a lot of diversity in the morphological, in the morphologies that you use to populate the network. So let me give a little tiny introduction to neurobiology so that we at least fix some language and then we can understand something about the, the networks that we're looking at and the neurons that we're looking at. So what we see in this slide is a cartoon of a neuron. We see over here the cell body of the neuron, which is where the sort of the most, most of the information processing goes on. Here, these little fingers sticking out here are what are called the dendrites. So these are where the neuron receives information, incoming information, and incoming electrical signals from other neurons. The electrical signals then transport it down the dendrite to the cell body. And what goes on in the cell body is that, in particular, there is a buildup of potential on the membrane of the cell. And when the potential reaches a certain level, then the cell emits what's called an action potential, or it can emit what's called an action potential, which then sends electrical signal down the axon, which is here, which is encased in myelin, which is a sort of insulator, which makes the signal transmit better. And then it reaches another 
uh, neuron where the axon of this of this first neuron meets the dendrite of this neuron. They form connections that are called synapses. Here's a representation of what's actually going on at a synapse that I won't discuss, has to do with neurotransmitters, that then transmit the signal from the axon of one to the dendrite of the other, then causing maybe the, the membrane potential on this neuron to raise and then a signal to be transmitted. So this is sort of the basic cartoon of what's going on in neurobiology. But as we saw in this image, the cartoon is not very representative of reality. Here what we see in these different cells from rat cortex is if we look carefully here, we can see the, the soma, the cell body. And what we see here is only the dendrites, actually. There are no axons that are pictured here. And what we see is there's a wide variety of these dendrites. So all of these are what are called pyramidal cells. These are neural cells that are what are called excitatory. They build up the signal in the brain, they amplify it. And the, there are two types of dendrites for a pyramidal cell. The pyramidal cell has basically kind of a triangular or pyramidal shaped uh, soma, cell body. And from the apex, you have what's called the apical dendrite that's going, usually stretching towards the surface of the brain. And then you have what are called the basal dendrites, which are these sort of root-like structures here at the bottom. So it's sort of like a tree growing up, which is the apical dendrite with its roots, which are the basal dendrites. And then you would have the axon, which would be a completely different part of this picture. And it turns out that by focusing on the dendrites of these neurons, you can already say a lot about both their structure and their function. So what I want to talk to you now is about how we can go about doing some kind of objective classification of different kinds of branching structures like these neuron morphologies using tools from TDA. So actually the, the kind of TDA we use here is not all that sophisticated or, power, or seemingly powerful, but it turns out to do the job very well. So this is the kind of comparison we want to do. So we're looking here at what are called reconstructions, digital reconstructions of two actual biological neurons. Where these come from is that some graduate student or postdoc was looking at a slice of brain material under a microscope and very carefully recording XYZ coordinates of a lot of points along this neuron so that its shape could be stored digitally. And so these are two different pyramidal cells, again, from rat cortex that have been digitally reconstructed in this way. And if you look at them, you can say, well, if I try to compare them, what can I say? What, what, how can I characterize in some sort of mathematical way, quantify the differences between them? And this is where the expert who has seen a lot of cells under the microscope would say, oh, well, this is a this and this is a that, and they're obviously different. And, but we'd like to have some way so that you don't have to spend 20 years bending over a microscope to be able to say that these two neurons are different and be able to put them into the right classes. So that's the kind of thing we'd like to do. And as I said, over the years, people have developed lots of different approaches to trying to solve this problem. One of them has been to study what they call morphometrics, such as counting things like the number of branches, the total length of the tree, the maximal distance from, from the soma to one of the leaves of the tree, bifurcation angles. There are all sorts of, sort of uh, numbers you can associate to a morphology like this. And you can say, well, can I use these sort of numbers to classify? And what these two uh, figures are supposed to show is that they really don't suffice. So here we're looking at three different parts of the neuron. We're looking at this axon, which is this one that, you know, extending to the dendrite of the, of the next neuron, and the two parts of the dendrite, the apical dendrite, so the one stretching towards the surface, and the basal dendrite, which is the one that looks more like a, a bunch of roots. And here there's just a various, oops, I'm sorry. These are various uh, comparisons one can make, like plotting the total length of the tree versus the number of branches and other things. And we see that it, it doesn't either doesn't cluster at all, as in the case of panels B and C, or if it does cluster, it's clustering the wrong things together. It's clustering axons with apical dendrites, with basal dendrites. It's just making a mess of it. It's not really coming up with the structure properly. So you could say, well, let's do something more sophisticated. Let's look at all of these morphometrics together and let's do some sort of PCA analysis. And that's what this figure over here is looking at the first, second, and third PCA components of these vectors of morphometrics and seeing whether that provides us with some sort of clustering. Here doing again the comparison of axons, apical dendrites, and basal dendrites. And what we see is that it's really not working very well in this context. Now, 
in the work that neuroscientists have done, they've also, you know, they, they can find the various uh, various choices of morphometrics that provide good answers. But in general, it's it, the classification that you get depends a lot on which morphometrics you consider. So what can we do? Well, we're to applied topologists, so we want to try to use topolo topological data analysis to get there. So the idea is that we want to be able, we're going to try to associate to each neuron morphology, so to each one of these digital reconstructions, a persistence diagram that couples together the topology or the combinatorial branching structure of the tree together with its embedding in space. The embedding in space is really important because it's, it's capturing things like how twisted the branch is. Is the branch actually bending back? That happens as well. And then you said it's a way of encoding the whole shape of the tree of being able to capture topologically the correlations that there are between things like the probability of bifurcation together with how far you are from the soma and things like that. So persistence diagram. And then we want to study the populations of neurons by using analyzing statistics of the associated persistence diagrams in any one of the standard ways that one uses in topological data analysis. So how are we going to associate a persistence diagram to a neuron morphology? So we're going to, the approach that we tried first was to associate to a persistence diagram a persistence image such as that uh, introduced by Henry. But in our case, because it turns out that the points close to the diagonal in our persistence diagram, which as I'll show in a moment, correspond to smaller branches on the tree, are actually really important in this classification process. So we're, we look at the persistence diagram associated to, sorry, the persistence image associated with persistence diagrams, and then we look at some sort of Euclidean distance between these persistence diagrams, persistence images rather. Okay, so here's a, a brief overview of the, what we call the TMD or the topological morphology descriptor. So the idea here is that here we have some neuron and we'll look at what's going on as we, we want to take this tree and break it up into its branches. So we're going to sort of take the, the tree apart branch by branch, breaking, turning the branches into bars in a persistent star code, or looking at them, the corresponding persistence diagram here. And so each bar here corresponds to some branch. So at each barfication point, we're going to choose one of the branches to break off and turn into a bar. And the other branch is going to turn into, is going to continue and turn into a longer bar. Catherine, can I so, interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, th I think there's somebody whose audio is, is not muted. We have the power to mute everybody, but I don't see this person right now. I'm going to try to mute everybody, so you'll get muted, Catherine, but then I'll unmute you. Okay, Catherine, I think you're... Um, Can you hear me? Okay, you're now unmuted. And, uh, and just everyone else in the audience, please keep your video muted unless you have a question. I think it'll improve the, the audio. So sorry about that, Catherine, but take it away. No problem. No problem. So, any, so this is just a, we're going to take this, this tree, this branching uh, structure apart. We're going to break it into its, into its branches by making a certain choice at each bifurcation of which branch turns into a bar and which branch continues. And then look at the associated barcode or persistence diagram. So more explicitly, somewhat more explicitly, so we're going to do a diagram like this, where this greenish blob represents the soma or the cell body of the neuron. And here these blue points indicate the leaves of the tree everywhere. And this is showing how we, you know, we're taking this branching structure and turning it into a barcode. So what we see here are all of the Can I interrupt here. real quick? Sure. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, um, this is, you're looking at just the axon or just the dendrite? Just the dendrite. Just the dendrite, okay. Okay, Sorry, so the main reason why we're, no problem. The main reason why we're looking at the dendrite, and here we're actually just looking at this apical dendrite, because it turns out, I mean, we have analyzed the basal dendrites as well by the same method, and it turns out the basal dendrites are, they don't really distinguish so much between the neurons. What really distinguishes between them is their apical, de, apical dendrites. 
The reason we don't think about axons is because there aren't very many good digital reconstructions of axons. They're much harder to reconstruct to, to actually get, in, get from slices and so on because they're very long. And there, and, and there are other reasons why they're just, there just isn't that much data about them yet. So we're okay. focusing really on these apical dendrites. Okay. Thank so you. to go back to this, you're welcome. To go back to this diagram, so what we see is that we're taking the branches here and then converting them into, into bars in a certain way. And each place where we see a little open circle here, it's a moment, oops, see, sorry, come back. It's um, a point where we're choosing between, oops, it doesn't want me to do this. We're choosing between doing, between terminating something and continuing. So with the, if I can do this without changing, with these two branches here. So this is one of these points where we chose which one of the branches continued at a particular bifurcation. And basically it's the one that's been coming from the farthest. We see that with this pair here, where the decision was made that this one started further out. And so it's the one we choose to continue. It's a version of the eldest rule that we use. So this is the way we take this tree in its branching structure and turn it into a barcode. Okay, so what's the input to this topological morphology descriptor? What do we use? So in abstract terms, it's just a rooted tree embedded in R3, where we fix the root, we give it a name. And then we look at the set of nodes, which is composed of the set of leaves, L, and the set B of bifurcation points. So it turns out that in a neuron, I mean, in an arbitrary tree, you could imagine having, you know, a trifurcation or, or more. You could have several leaves going, uh, several branches going off. In neurons, it's all essentially bifurcations. So we restrict to thinking about trees with bifurcations. And then we have some function on the nodes associating uh, non-negative real number to any node. And the one we usually use, but it's not the only one we've tried, is the radial distance, because our tree is embedded in space. So we have this notion of radial distance from the node. We, could, we also, you can also use path distance, and there, there are other variants of a function you could choose on the nodes. That's all you need for input to this, to this algorithm. And the basic way it works is this. So here we have this, uh, a tree is actually just sitting in a plane right now. But where we see the distance, we're looking at radial distance from the root R. And we start the furthest out here. And so we start with this node here at H and move to its bifurcation, its next bifurcation, which is this point J. And they say, okay, well, what was the other leaf? The other leaf was G here which is less far out from R than H. And so we take, we break off this branch from J to G and turn it into a bar like this. We continue on to the next bifurcation point, which is D. And at that point, you look at the other leaf, it's E. It was less far out than H. So we break off the branch ED and turn it into a branch like this. Okay. And then we continue and in a similar way, we just at each bifurcation point, we decide what to break off. When we get here, we have to go back and say, ah, what was going on there? We actually have to go all the way back here. This is a case where you have a branch that actually bends back, where the, this point actually is closer to the root than the bifurcation point is. And that gives us a bar that looks like this here. And once we translate this barcode into a persistence diagram, we see that actually most of the points actually lie under the diagonal, which is atypical for uh, the persistence diagrams we often look at. While there's this one point, AB, which corresponds to a branch that was bending backwards, is, over, is above the diagonal. And this point RH here corresponds to this, this is the longest branch that we keep that goes from the far the leaf that's the furthest out all the way to the root. So it's very simple very straightforward kind of uh, uh, zero dimensional persistence, but it captures a lot about the structure of the tree. So where do we go from there? Well, when people are doing these kinds of digital reconstructions of neurons, so you have the poor graduate student bending over his or her microscope and carefully noting down the coordinates of the points and so on, there are lots of little errors that can come into that, of course. And you could have errors where, you know, the, the exact position of all the points is slightly off. 
Okay, so you could have you know, the real thing could actually be the, the dotted red line and what you were recorded was the, the solid black. Or it could be that you missed some little branches or maybe you noted down some branches that weren't really there. So you could be off a little bit in terms of the small branches. So we actually did prove a theorem which shows that the, this descriptor is actually stable with respect to these sorts of small errors of reconstruction, the kind of errors that can actually show up when people are, are doing these kinds of measurements in the lab. So it feels comfortable about that. One thing we did when we first uh, designed this uh, topological morphology descriptor was to do a validation on random trees where we vary things like branch angle, degree of randomness, the length of the branches, and the depth of the tree, how many layers you had in the, in the tree. And then uh, did looked at the distance between the corresponding persistence diagrams when you were doing these kinds of random trees uh, using just the bottleneck distance and did uh, just a dendrogram type um, analysis and ended up with quite high accuracy for the, the classification of these of these random trees. It was on the order of 88% or something like that. So it's like, okay, that's good. That's a, um, a simulation in silico kind of test. We wanted to test it actually on real neurons to we managed to do to classify. So we did an interspecies comparison. So we were looking at neurons that came from cat, dragonfly, flute fly, mouse, and rat. So these are again some of these digital reconstructions. And what you see is that, well, you know, even as just humans looking at these things, you could say, well, I obviously see uh, five different classes of neurons, but we'd like the computer to be able to do this without any help from the human. So we computed the, had a, a, a population of cat neurons and, and a population of dragonfly neurons, so a whole set of neurons of these different types and computed the associated TMDs, topological morphology descriptors, which are these barcodes, and then the associated persistence diagrams, calculated the persistence images. And then what we have in column D here is the, um, the average persistence image for the whole population. And then the idea is to say, okay, can we use these persistence images in order to do a supervised classification of these five different families of neurons. So it turns out that uh, here we were doing just a, a decision tree and the, the distance we were using was the distance between the persistence images and then doing a, a supervised classification in this sense. And what we were able to see is that uh, we could detain quite high accuracy. So if we even take this as training set, something like 60% of the set, then we could attain very high accuracy. Some of their, this is a confusion matrix here showing how well things were classified. When we, if we have a rat neuron, is it being classified as a rat neuron? If we have a cat neuron, is it being classified as a cat neuron? Those worked quite well. There was some confusion between fruit flies and mice, apparently. But otherwise, it was working very well at doing these kinds of classifications using these persistence images. So this was a good indication that this is a, a worthwhile tool to try to apply to actual biological cases. In this case, there was like, we knew exactly what the classes were, and we were able to, to show that by doing a supervised classification, we ended up with what we would expect to get. Now let's go back to the original comparison I was talking about, where we had two digital reconstructions of pyramidal cells from rat cortex. So in this case, here we have, this guy is the persistence image corresponding to this neuron, and this guy is the persistence image corresponding to this neuron. We look at their persistence images, and the difference between the two neurons just sort of jumps out at us. This is basically saying, look, if we look at this persistence image, this part here is telling us, oh, look, we have a lot more branchy stuff going on here, which we see, but this sort of highlights this as being a really important difference. Also, the fact that this area here is a lot bigger, a lot um, more intense indicates, yeah, that we have a lot more branching stuff going on here near the soma than we do in this case. What this square here is showing is this sort of one of these persistence images minus the other in order to show where the differences are. So the differences are in this tufting at the end and in the more extensive branching that's going on near the soma. So this using this method enables us to quantify uh, and characterize in this manner the, the difference between these neurons. Now, 
we tried a harder task, which is to classify rat pyramidal cells. So again, this is something that the experts have worked on for, for decades. And they're not always in agreement. So it can happen that you give the same set of neurons to classify to two different neuroscientists and they'll provide different classifications. Or you can give the same set of neurons to the same neuroscientist on two different days and get two different classifications. So you'd like to have some method that did not have that subjective human element to it. And so we wanted to see whether the TMD would provide us with a nice objective way of classifying rat pyramidal cells. So here's the process we went through. First of all, we, when you're looking at these pyramidal cells, the cell body of the neuron is in one of the six layers. So if you look at the cortex of a, of a rat, it has six different layers. And so you can classify, you can first just take your neurons and say, okay, in which of these six layers was the cell body located? And so we sort the cells according to the layer in which the cell body or the soma lies. Then we calculated the, computed the, the TMD of each cell, or its, its image, and then we applied the same kind of classification method that we applied to the cells of cat, dragonfly, mouse, etc., looking at distance between persistence images. So that gives us a classification like that. And then we trained a supervised classifier on the labels that the experts proposed for these cells. And then uh, once we had done that, we compared the classification by the expert proposed labels to the classification that was proposed by the, the TMD and computed the, the accuracy, which is the degree of agreement between the expert proposed labels and the TMD labels. And then we repeated this for the for just a set of randomized labels that had the same cardinality as the, the number of expert proposed labels for a particular la layer. And if the expert-based classification had a higher degree of accuracy than the randomized classification, we accepted it and said, okay, that's good. It, you know, it agrees more with the TMD than the others. But if it didn't, then we tried to propose a reclassification based on the TMD, the accuracy of which we had to verify using other notions of distance between persistence diagrams, just so there wouldn't be any overfitting or anything like that. So we were using, there was a, a variety of distances that we, we tried where it was comparing basically to projections on a lot of different directions. And it was interesting to see that different kinds of distances were more effective in, in the various, various of these six layers in the brain structure. So, this is an image now showing us the, all the different types of rat pyramidal cells. So here we have the six layers, one, two, three, four, five, six. So they go from, one is near the surface of the brain and it goes deeper and deeper into the brain structure. And here we have, you see the little dark dots, those are the cell bodies or the somas of the, of the neurons. And so we have some of them that are in layer two, some in layer three, some in layer four, some down in layer five, and some in layer six and it's a, oops, different kinds of branching structures. And then for each of these, we look at the associated persistence diagrams or the average for the population. And we see that they're quite different depending on different kinds of neurons. So this is what we did. You do this to sort them by layer and then do this, uh, calculate these persistence images and then use those to propose a classification. Now, just before showing something about the classification, let's just take a little closer look at the comparison between the reconstructions of the neurons and what their persistence images look like. So here we have UPC, which is an, what's called an untufted pyramidal cell. It doesn't have this little, or it has very little of this sort of tuft at the top of the apical tree. And indeed, we see that all of the branchiness is sort of concentrated near the, the soma. Here, this is a, Another kind of pyramidal cell that has some tufting, so it has some branchiness towards the end, and we see that here. And then these guys are both what are called thickly tufted pyramidal cells. They have a big bunch of branchiness towards the end, and this is indicated by having these bright colors on the persistence diagram. So that's the sort of thing that we're studying. So when we do this, the classifications that the experts proposed worked in <clears throat> all the layers except layers three and five, where we, at first, when we looked at the um, expert-based classification in layer five, this was the confusion matrix it came up with. The classification was good. It was around 86%, but there was 
indeed some confusion between there were some neurons, it wasn't quite clear that they would actually been classified by the experts in the right category. So we used instead the, the TMD classification and proposed a different classification of some of the neurons into these two different types of thickly tufted pyramidal cells, and ended up with a nice 97% classification with only one neuron that was sort of an ambiguous case. It wasn't clear what class it went into. So here the TMD helped us to sort of clean up the classification. What happened in layer five was a bit different. So here we see some examples of what these neurons look like in layer five and what their associated persistence diagrams look like. So in um, the experts, most experts tended to claim that there were two of these thickly tufted pyramidal cells that were very long and had a big tuft here. They were called A and B. And what we discovered when looking at the whole population of both A and B was that the TMD made it clear that, in fact, there, was not, there were not two classes, but that there was, in fact, a convergence between the two classes. You can sort of see how one class modulates into the other when you look at these persistence images. So it's actually a continuum of classes, and that really these two should be identified as the same class. And when you do that, some sort of the, there were, the accuracy of the classification becomes extremely high. So this was something that was possible to demonstrate because we have the we had these persistence images which make it very clear that it was actually a continuum across the two classes. That the distance between these persistence diagrams is becoming smaller and smaller. One can apply similar methods to actually clustering human pyramidal cells. Now with human pyramidal cells there are many fewer examples to work with. It's not so easy to collect cells from humans. You have to have a very good reason to get nerve cells, uh, to get uh, brain cells from humans. These things tend to happen when people are having brain surgery for various reasons. And, but more and more, there are some of these cells available, and people would like to understand their morphology in order to send something about their function again. So in this case, uh, considering the case of quite a number of human pyramidal cells from layers one, two, and three of the cortex. Humans also have six layers in their cortex. So here looking at, looking at layers one, two, and three. And we had all these different digital reconstructions of cells. Now, there's a neuroscientist in Jerusalem, uh, Idan Segev, who has a deep intuition for how, how neurons work. And his intuition was that these, these neurons had really, you could be able, should be able to classify these neurons into different families based on their electrical behavior, how they react to uh, incoming current, and how they react um, to signals and so on. But with all the usual statistical methods, he couldn't find a way to separate this into two classes, actually to cluster it. Then Vida Canari, who has led the research on this project all along, went to visit Idan and said, well, let's first try to do an unsupervised classification on the morphologies, because the morphologies are supposed to influence function. And when she did that, doing an unsupervised clustering, so computed the associated uh, TMDs and the persistence images, and then used distance between the persistence images to perform clustering. And it turned out that it clustered into two different groups. We can sort of see examples of the two groups here that are what are called slim tufted. So we don't have much going on towards the end of the tree here, the apical tree, and those that are thickly tufted. And to be able to show that this was pro provided a very nice clustering into two classes of profuse tufted and slim tufted. And what was actually remarkable was that once we had this classification into these two uh, distinct morphological types. There are only a few neurons where there was some sort of confusion between which type they were. It turned out that all those that were profuse tufted had a very similar electrical behavior, and those that were slim tufted had a similar electrical behavior. So they were able to deduce the correct electrical classification from the morphological classification, which had come thanks to this particular algorithm. Now, the title of my talk was How to Synthesize Digital Neurons. And so I'm going to be able to say a few words about this now. This is a paper that we are in the process of finishing right now and will submit very soon. And for that reason, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to tell you as much of the story as I would like to, but I'll be able to at least to hint at some of what is going on. What I've learned is being involved with people in the neuroscience world is that um, sometimes you can't 
you know, you can't tell your stories quite as easily and quite as freely as you can when you're just being a mathematician. So anyway, synthesis of digital neurons, what is it about? So it's really about the inverse problem, right? So we, I explained before how to go from a neuron, a digital reconstruction of a neuron, and extract from it a barcode, and then a persistence diagram, or then a persistence image, whatever. But it'd be really cool to be able to take the barcode and construct a neuron from it. And uh, as, as I said, we'd like to have a lot of examples to be able to populate some of these digital reconstructions of entire networks that are being done. So how can we do that? Well, this is something that, that Lita has been working on a lot for the last couple of years that we've been talking a lot about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of this story now. But in order to understand the story, I need to tell you a bit about how neurons grow first. So the first step is what's called initiation of neurons. So neurites. So you start with the, the soma, the cell body, and then the neuron, the neurites, so the dendrites and the axons start growing out from the, this neuron. So you can think of it as some sort of sphere, and then you're going to choose sort of starting points on your sphere. So in some sense, you're choosing a bunch of angles, and then you're going to start growing your dendrites and your axons from there. So they start elongating, they start growing like this. Then there's a part that happens in biology where the axon starts finding its path through the network. How, where is it supposed to go in order to make the right connections? And then they start branching and they continue elongating and so on. Now, because we have no axons, or we, do, you know, we sort of fake the axons because there aren't many good axon reconstructions, we don't talk about that part. We're just going to, we're going to synthesize the dendrites of a neuron for now. That's what we've been doing. So the synthesis algorithm, unfortunately, is censored. <laughs> I was hoping to be able to talk about it, but we're still a couple weeks too early to be able to present it. But let's just say that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's based on trying to do a synthetic, a digital version of the way neurons actually grow taking into account you know, a population of persistence diagrams or, or uh, persistence barcodes to give us a hint of where uh, branches should bifurcate, where they should terminate, and so on. We have to decorate the persistence barcode with information about the angles at which the neurons branch and a little more information than that, but basically it's this sort of augmented persistence barcode that you can use where you have the bars and you have some information about the angles at which um, the neurons bifurcate. But as I said, I'm, I apologize, this was censored at the last minute, so there we go. <laughs> but I can tell you a little bit about what the results look, look like. So it turns out that one can synthesize both uh, pyramidal cells, these excitatory cells, and what are called inhibitory cells, which are the ones that are sort of calming down the electrical activity in the network. So pyramidal cells make up about 80%, 80-85% of the network. So here we see, uh, here we were synthesizing rat cells. So you have a population of biological cells that you take and you find the associated TMDs, these associated persistence barcodes, and they use that population of persistence barcodes to then synthesize a population of, of neurons that you hope will match some of the biological characteristics. Now, if you just look at this picture, you see, okay, you know, I'm, I'm matching in each layer, two, three, four, five, six, biological, actual biological neurons to synthesize neurons of the same type. And at least when you kind of eyeball it, if you're not a real expert, you can say, oh, that looks like pretty good, you know, synthesized versions of these biological cells. And you can even start populating a whole network, the six layers of the cortex, with these synthesized neurons. So, so yeah, doing pretty well. You can also do this for these interneurons. I don't know how well you can see this, but these interneurons, so these are these inhibitory cells. These are make up 15, 20% of the cells in the brain. Play a very important role in not letting things get overexcited. And again, the synthesized cells match sorry, match the uh, biological cells quite well, at least from the visu, right? But we want to do something more quantitative than that. So here, what it did is took the barcode from one pyramidal cell in layer three, and sort of um, from that one pyramidal cell created a whole population of synthetic neurons just based on its barcode, where 
the the fact that we created we have a population that we have um, actual sorry many different uh, distinct instantiations is the from the fact that there are probabilities associated with bifurcation and termination that's not just the straight barcode it's we have these these probabilities which are built into it so from one persistence diagram we build a whole population and when we do that we can say okay let's compare various morphological features of the usual population of these particular pyramidal cells to this population that I've created synthetically from the persistence diagram of one cell in the family. And we see that so there's a number of different morphological features we're looking at here and comparing each time the, uh, the average for this, bio this synthesized population with the average for the biological population. And we see that it actually does quite well. It's matching very well. We can do the same thing with uh, layer five now. So here, instead we have like a whole population of layer five neurons, and from this population of layer five neurons, we ex uh, pyramidal cells, we extracted a bunch of persistence diagrams and then applied the synthesis algorithm using these persistence diagrams to create a synthetic population over here. And then again, these violin plots here are looking at the normalized values of a lot of these different morphological features of the apical dendrites or of the basal dendrites, we did both, and just show that since these, these violins are in general pretty symmetric, that the synthesized population matches the biological population very well. So at least morphologically, we're doing fine. But morphology is not the end of the story. You, I mean, you really want to see that the neurons are going to function in a similar way. So it turns out that given a digital reconstruction like this or a synthesized neuron, you can build into it a, uh, an electrical structure as well. There are ways of building an, uh, the electrical model into a given reconstruction. And remarkably, when you take either a biological neuron or a synthesized neuron and you build into it this electrical model, you get very similar electrical behavior when you put in. So in this case, they're putting in a current that's 120% above the threshold. And we see that the reaction is very, very similar. So here we're looking at voltage versus time. And so we do the same kind of comparison of all kinds of electrical features that we did with the morphological features and see that, in fact, the biological populations compare very nicely with the synthesized populations as well, which is really important if you want to use these in order to populate some kind of a network. Question, when you do these um, electrical experiments, you're, you're doing this on a computer. It's sort of like you have the shape and you, and you plug in on a computer, you synthesize what the electricity would do. Is that right? Exactly. So it depends. So one thing I haven't mentioned is it depends as well on the diameters of the, of the dendrites. And there's a way that we built into the synthesis algorithm the fact that as you move out from the soma, the diameters become gradually smaller and smaller. And by building that in as well, we're able to, um, and then you can integrate the electrical behavior into that. But that's a very complex model that I, I don't understand. But they have a way of doing it. Okay. Right. So the synthesis algorithm seems to work well to provide us with good digital models. So why synthesize? I've said a few words about it so far. I want to just conclude by trying to explain a bit more why, why we even care about doing something like this. So, so neuroscientists have tried for a while to, you know, they want, they want to be able to understand where these morphologies are coming from and to be able to synthesize them is one way to really understand. And in particular, if you want to understand how neurons are getting connected to each other, then you really want to understand a lot about the, the structure of the, of the neurons, their morphology. So here at the Blue Brain Project, we're working with <clears throat> digital reconstructions, first part of the brain of a rat, and actually they've now moved to uh, doing reconstructions of mouse brain using data from the Allen Brain Project. But the original paper that was, uh, the, the big paper that was uh, published by Blue Brain uh, four years ago in Cell was about reconstruction of part of the somatosensory cortex of the brain of a rat, so that's part of the cortex that's involved in processing of primary sensory information. So here we see the, the six layers, and we see examples of excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And in order to have a good and accurate, as accurate as possible, uh, biological model, you want to have the kind of variability in the neurons that you 
used to populate this network that you actually have in biology. So that's why we need such diversity. And in order to, to explain how important that diversity is, I just say something about you know what how we've gone about studying this network, which is to consider this uh, reconstruction as a directed graph, and then to analyze this very large directed graph with 31,000 vertices and 8 million directed edges as uh, in terms of its certain significant subnetworks, which are little feed forward pieces of the network, which we call directed simplices. So you could have various connections like this. The idea is that these directed simplices work as feed forward mechanisms and that they're sort of more and more robust versions of directed edges. And so we just count these things and they also build up a simple complex of which we can compute the homology and also learn interesting things from that. That's another long story, but I just wanted to point out that we're counting these directed simplices as a way of, as a sort of primary indication of the degree of organization and complexity of this network. So to illustrate the importance of precise morphologies, here I'm showing a plot where we're looking here, this is the blue brain network called BioM here. We're counting the number of these directed simplices in each dimension. So it goes, it's roughly 80 million simplices of dimension two, roughly 65 million of dimension three, and even it goes up to dimension seven. There are some seven simplices, roughly 4,006 simplices, and so on. So there are a lot of these high dimensional simplices. Of course, numbers by themselves don't mean so much. You need to do some sort of comparison with a null model, so you can compare some with Erdős Renyi, but that's not really fair. The important comparison with respect to precise morphologies has to do with this comparison with these red and yellow curves here where there is a biological model, yes, but it doesn't take into account really these precise morphologies. It's much more, it's more like you're thinking about your neuron as kind of a cloud and the probability of cloud for intersection of, of two, you know, when two neurons actually create a connection. And you see that when you don't take those precise morphologies into account, then the complexity of the network that you get, at least as measured by the number of directed simplices, is much smaller. The highest dimensional simplex is in dimension five, and at every stage of the process, you have fewer of these directed simplices, fewer of these units that work to feed the, the signal forward. So those precise morphologies are important for capturing the real complexity of the network. Also, as I said, we're using this topological synthesis algorithm in order to actually synthesize neurons that they have used now to populate a reconstruction of mouse neocortex, for example, and it's providing us with large populations of diverse neurons that can be used for this purpose. Such a large and complex project would not be possible without a big team of people to help with all kinds of capabilities. So the team consists of people working at the EPFL, well, Martina Scolomero is now at KTH, Sebastian Morin, who is a uh, master's student, people working at the Blue Brain Project or in the Laboratory for Neuromicrocircuitry. Lida Canari has led the research, has been, you know, really the um, guiding force in this project and first for classification and now for synthesis. We've also worked with Pavel Dlotko, Ran Levy and Yon Wang at the Allen Brain Project in order to realize this project. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Down in the left-hand corner, you see the articles in which this research has been published. And as I said, the synthesis we will be submitting any time now. And if this sort of research intrigues you, well, Blue Brain is hiring postdocs. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Catherine. So uh, are there any questions? Um, if you want to ask a question, remember everybody is muted, like so that there's no sound effects like there were earlier. Um, so yeah, so in order to ask a question, first unmute yourself. Uh, so actually, I have one question. Then I mean, it's uh, oh, do you maybe have a question? Or okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned at one point uh, uh, that like you've done like uh, experiments with the ray, uh, rat brain, and then you're moving on to mice brain. What's the difference? Like you know, why would you pick one brain over another? So they started with rat because when they started working here 15 years ago or so, there was a lot more data for rats than for mice because rats are considerably bigger than mice, so their neurons are easier to study and uh, their behavior is more interesting than that of mice in general. Um, but because of the Allen Brain Project, which has devoted tremendous energy and resources to studying the brains of mice, 
Now there's a huge amount of data available from mice, and that's why they're moving on to mice from rats. So the difference is a question of size. It's a question of, I mean, the, the exact kinds of neurons are not the same between rats and mice. It's not simply a question of scaling things down. We've been able, actually using topology, to prove that it's a lot more, there's a lot more involved to comparing mice and rat uh, neurons than simply a scaling factor. And it was nice to be able to, again, use this TMD to, uh, to prove that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I was curious about that part. Yeah, but good um, question. And yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, and then also, like, with axons, you said that there are the sort of no good methods right now. Do you think that that is going to change at all, or is...? They're pushing very hard for it to change. Okay. And so, I mean, the, the, te the lab techniques for doing these reconstructions are getting better and better. And you know, mm -hmm. I, I've talked to people who say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting some axons, we're getting some axons. So, um, uh -huh. and okay. there's, I think people are also motivated by the fact that Blue Brain really wants axons. They say, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll, okay. we'll actually yeah, go yeah, more yeah. this. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, so uh, if there are no further questions, then I would now ask everyone to unmute themselves so that we can clap for Catherine for her wonderful talk. Yeah. So. Thank you. Sorry, I have a few and, questions. Uh, will... Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Cool. Everyone can hear? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all. Uh, the, it was a very fascinating work. Uh, I really enjoyed the work. I have some very basic questions. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, the computation time was not your problem, right? No. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Actually, the computation is quite fast because the computation is linear in the number of nodes. So it's really not a problem. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, during the talk, you talked. Uh, you you mentioned some uh, techniques for. Uh, measuring the distance between the persistent diagrams. So what sort of techniques? Because uh, I just knew two of them. So like uh, the bottleneck and the, the PD sphere or the Riemannian. Yeah, so the, we were looking at slice Wasserstein distance and I can't remember them all at the top of my head, I'm sorry. But there were like four or five different distances that we looked at and it was interesting to, there, if you look at the paper that um, was we published in Cerebral Cortex this year, in the supplementary information, we talk about to do a comparison between the different distances and talk about where where they were useful and why. And actually, it turned out that very often just the most simple notion of distance between persistence images turned out to be um, the best for many situations. Uh, is there any? like reason that some of them are useful or some of them are fitted and like? I don't know. I mean, I think that's a good question. I think that the results that we got sort of point to uh, a problem, uh, not a problem, but a question, like how can you tell, is there any way you can tell which distances are going to be useful in any particular situation? Because I was surprised to see how, how different the results, how, how, how much better some distances were than others at providing accurate classifications. So I have a, a, another kind of very stupid question. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the way you associated uh, persistent diagrams with your uh, neurons was, you know, it's working and, you know, it's good. Uh, so if, if, if I want to associate some simplicial complex and then try to calculate the persistent homology like that way, so is it, is it kind of possible? Sure. I mean, so this is one thing, this is what we, we started off when we started working with Lida four and a half years ago. The idea was to somehow use, so as I said, they, were, they do these digital reconstructions as a bunch of points in three space, right? And to use those actual points in three space to do some sort of uh, RIPS complex or alpha complex or something like that and, and do persistence diagrams with that. Um, at the time, it was computationally almost out of reach. For, for some of them because we had just too many points. And then, uh, and then we realized that we actually could get a good result just by doing this, this simpler thing. And so uh, we stuck with that. They come back and looked again at the idea of, of using like something like an alpha complex based on the, uh, the actual points that are recorded for the digital reconstruction. And it didn't seem to improve the classification. So I don't think it's necessary in this case to do so. 
uh, 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 I have uh, another question. So this this kind of technique. So can we use it for some other, you know, uh, machine learning or the other things like image classification? So do you, do you think so the way you have associated? So for example, if you can associate something with a kind of neuron thing, and then, you know, do you think it's useful in that way? Um, and I think I think that um, so the the technique that we the this sort of technique can be extended easily to. Uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have something as, as simple as a tree with a root. You, if you have any kind of like graph where you fix a base point, you just have to have a point of reference, some sort of natural point of reference with respect to which you do this sort of thing that can be generalized to that context with no problem. Um, yeah, I think it can probably be, be generalized further. Sure. Okay, so uh, one last question. So uh, this data, is it available or is it going to be available online or, you know? The, uh, the uh, so there's use. a the the Blue Brain project has an, a website called the Blue Brain Portal, P O R T A L, and on the portal you can download all kinds of stuff. I mean their goal is to be really really open source about all kinds of things, and the code for the TMD is freely available on GitHub, so you can down you can use it freely, no problem. So Sarah, I'm afraid I have to go. Yes, I know. I, I, yeah, I, I figured. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, thank no you so much also for the questions. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. we have three minutes to one. And uh, so now we have to say goodbye, but we will see you again soon at our online okay. seminar. Thank you so much again for your wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.